Instructions for accessing subtitles in a language other than English are included on our board meeting's webpage as well as in the description below. Instrucciones para acceder a los subtítulos en un idioma que no sea el inglés se incluyen en nuestra página web de reuniones de la Junta, así como en la descripción a continuación. Good evening. Um, welcome to the November 15th, 2023 Ross Valley School Board Director, um, Board of Trustees regular meeting. We are in the district office tonight and we are missing Trustee Daniel Cassidy and Trustee Shelley Hamilton is not here at the moment. She is coming later this evening. Um, so present are the other three trustees, um, Langels Cobb and O'Neill and myself, uh, Rachel Levac. And uh, first item on the agenda tonight is calling the meeting to order, and then we will be going into closed session. Um, the items we are discussing in closed sessions are um, conference with labor negotiators pursuant to government code section 54957.6, all employee groups, CSEA, RBTA, confidential classified, classified management, and certificated management. I'm Rachel, yes. sorry to start. Can yes. you call the meeting? Oh yes, sorry, at 6.04, we're calling the meeting to order. Excuse me, forget about that. Um, there is conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, significant, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to government code 54956.9, subdivision D2 or 3, special ed program dispute, three cases, um, student SSID 564, <laughs> SSID 856-921-4730 and 430-9923-216. Um, there is no public here for public comment, so we will recess into closed session at 6.04. All right, um, welcome back. We are um, at the Ross Valley School District um, board meeting. It is November 15th, 2023. It is 7.20 and we are um, reconvening after closed session into open session. Um, Trustee Hamilton has um, showed up since then. <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted to take over the meeting now that you're here or... or... I am happy to let you continue uh, okay. running the meeting tonight. I've just been driving for about seven hours. So mm -hmm. probably okay. best for you to keep running. <laughs> <laughs> I will keep going then. So it's 7.21. We're reconvened back in open session. Um, the report out from closed session is um, there's nothing to report for item number three, which was conference with labor negotiators. Um, for number four, conference with legal counsel. Um, there were um, three votes taken and all three items on that number four passed. Um, and on to agenda item C, procedural items. We have the Pledge of Allegiance and a Democratic Refreshment or Mission moment. So I don't know if anybody here would like to uh, reflect on anything in particular or we should just do the pledge. I did not plan on reflecting on anything today, so. Okay. Yeah, I could say something actually. I just want to say that my heart remains heavy about what is happening all over the world. And my heart is most heavy for children on any side of whatever conflict there is, because these kids didn't ask for this. And we need to be aware that whatever we're doing as adults, it impacts the kids. And so I just want to reflect upon our mission to continue to work for our children and send wonderful healing vibes to the children who don't have that right now. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right. Next item is to adopt the agenda and time allocations. Did anybody have Make any changes or edits? Mm -hmm. I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion to adopt the agenda as stated. Mm -hmm. Second that. All right. And motion and second. Shelly? Aye. Chris? Aye. 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 Rachel? Aye. All right. So we have our agenda. Um, next item is communication. So we have public comments regarding items not on the public 
not on the open session agenda. Any no public comments? Any? Your chance. Okay. Um, let's see. And then item two is correspondence or communication to the board. And we have items um, listed there that were attached. I'm sure we got to read those. Any questions? Discussion? No. Um, e presentation. And uh, first item number one is the recommended approval of the settlement agreement with Altria in connection with multi district claims against Jewel Corporation and manufacturers of electronic cigarettes. All right. And um, we are going to have um, an attorney from the France group um, on uh, the phone tonight just in case um, you all have any questions. So I'm going to make a phone call to her now. And then once we know she's on, then I'll begin. Hi, Christina. Hi. Hi, it's Marcy Trahan from Ross Valley here. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you so much. I'm gonna just do a sound check and then we'll um, do uh, introductions for um, all of our trustees who are here with us this evening. And so um, again, Marcy Trahan, superintendent for Ross Valley. And Christina, I'm sorry, I wanna make sure I pronounce your last name correctly. Do you mind saying? Sure, it's Agazarian. Agazarian. Okay, I would have been very close to that. It looks, it's sound, it, you read it just like it sounds or whatever. It's pretty difficult. It's it pretty is. difficult. If you, if you didn't say it correctly, I wouldn't have been offended. Okay, well, I always like to pronounce names correctly, so thank you. All right, and then we, we do have uh, four trustees here with us this evening. One of um, our trustees is, is out, and so we have Chris Landles Cobb and Shelly Hamilton, Rachel Litwack, and Ryan O'Neill. <laughs> Hi. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. All right, and thank you so much uh, for being here tonight. Should there be any questions, and I'll go ahead and get started with this agenda item. And um, as uh, the trustees will likely remember, is this is about our third time having um, this particular um, class action uh, lawsuit on our agenda, and it has to do with um, the. Uh, uh, this France Law Group um, representing a number of school districts and other public entities um, because of the dangers of vaping and um, and the, specifically one of the companies being Jewel and, and Altria. And so um, that uh, course we signed on back in 2018, I want to say, when Dr. Bagley was our superintendent. And then it's taken, or sorry, 2020. And then it's taken three years to go through um, the full settlement. So we also came back here in, I want to say, um, was maybe about a year and a half ago. March. Um, oh, it was March, yes. And then, sorry, thank you. I could just read directly from here. So in March, um, on March 2nd, we also had a board meeting where um, we needed to make sure that the district was still interested in participating in the settlement or in the lawsuit. And then um, on July 26th, the settlement was reached with the final defendants in the Jewel um, e-cigarette litigation, Altria Group and Philip Morris, um, and Altria Client Services, Altria Enterprises, Altria Group Distribution Company, collectively Altria, having uh, proposed a $168,250 million um, government entity settlement. And RBSD has a deadline of November 30th that if we wish to, again, continue through this suit, then we need to be sure that the board takes action, which is why this um, agenda item is before you this evening. And then to notify the France group that we um, you, you have taken action to continue to participate. Um, the gross allocation... Sorry, there's uh, feedback. The gross allocation to the Ross Valley School District out of this settlement is $7,293, and that's the gross settlement. So there will be, of course, um, fees um, deducted out of that. And so not quite sure. Do you have any idea, Christina, roughly the amount that the district might be receiving? I actually do not have that, but you will get an accounting with all of that information. Okay, great. All right, so um, so as you know, the reason that we entered into this class action settlement is that 
we have experience in our schools, um, especially in middle school, where there have big kids who um, vape. And we know the dangers of vaping um, for our students. Um, and we also know that it, it's also a distraction from their education if they are thinking about when and where and how they might be trying to do this. We have case situations where they have done it on campus. And so um, part of our mission here in Ross Valley is always to keep our students safe. And so um, this, knowing that it's impacting, impacting our children and impacting their future, this is the reason that the trustees did um, vote to participate in the settlement um, in the first place and to continue on through the process as it was winding its way through. So um, we don't yet know the net amount to the district, but whatever that amount is, it will allow us to further enhance and continue to educate our students about the dangers of nic nicotine use and vaping, as well as to reduce and deter nicotine youth among our nicotine use among our youth. And so do the trustees have any questions? That um, yeah. Hi, Christina. This is Chris Sandals Cobb. I have a question about the payout. Most class action lawsuits pay out over a period of six to ten years. And I'm just curious as to what the payment structure would look like coming to RVSD. <clears throat> Sure. So all TRIO payments will actually be one payment, and it'll be in the first quarter of 2024, um, whereas the dual payments will be pro rata payments. So you should be getting your first one in a few weeks, and then it's um, staggered out through every December for the next four years. So this all TRIO payment will be one payment in the first quarter of 2024. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, of course. All right, any other questions? No, I remember having these discussions and understanding that it was a multi-step process. So I don't see any reason why we would want to complete what we started. Personally. It's a no-brainer. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Any other any questions? A question? Answer. All right. Any public comment? Oh, right. No? Public comment? All right. I will entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve <coughs> the, um, right. make a motion to approve the settlement agreement with Altria in connection with the multi district claims against the corporation and the manufacturers of electronic cigarettes. I have a second. A motion and a second, Shelly? Aye. Chris? Aye. Brian? Aye. Rachel? Aye. All right. Motion is passed. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. I really appreciate you being with us tonight. Of course. Thank you for your time. All right. I'll make sure I get that um, DocuSign taken care of likely tomorrow. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. All righty. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. -bye. You too. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. Okay, on to our next item, which is um, public disclosure or sunshining of the initial contract proposal for the 2023-2024 school year from the Ross Valley Teachers Association, or RVTA, to the Ross Valley School District. All right, and tonight we're going to have uh, members of the bargaining team do the presentation of the proposal. <laughs> And so there's seats up here. So every one of you gets a seat. Yeah. 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 Thank you for having us here tonight. Um, I'm Karen Tessator, president of Ross Valley Teachers Association, and we are here to sunshine the articles that we are going to open for the 23-24 school year contract proposal. And here we go. Uh -oh. Wait, I think it's on. I think I just I didn't know which button. This one. This one. This one. This one. Okay, we're learning how to use the clicker. <laughs> so I know everyone's in my classroom. Oh, I did the right button. How about that? Yay. Okay. Um, so, Ross Valley School District students deserve the best. To support our students, the Ross Valley Teachers Association is opening the following articles of the collective bargaining agreement. 
Article 3, wages, we seek to increase compensation so that Ross Valley School District is competitive in the county in order to attract and retain qualified professional staff because Ross Valley students deserve the best. We seek to increase district contributions to member health and welfare benefits to attract and retain qualified professional staff because our VSD students deserve the best. Um, <laughs> article 6, hours of employment. We seek to ensure teachers have time to develop innovative lessons, provide essential feedback to students and their families, and to differentiate lessons to meet the needs of each student because Ross Valley School District students deserve the best. Um, we would like to open the article on class size. We seek to reduce class size and increase the adult to student ratio to improve student success because our Ross Valley School District students deserve the best. We are united that Ross Valley School District students deserve the best. And um, I want to say at this time that we're really looking forward to continuing the incredible work that we did last year, we made together, made some really huge um, leaps forward, really helping the district come out of the bottom of the comps in the county. And we're looking forward to continuing that momentum and working with you again this year to see what we can do to make that happen. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And everyone else who came who's a teacher here, thank you for being here. And um, yes, public comment. Do we, do you have anything else? Or if not, do we have public comments? Because this would be a good time for public comment. Mm -hmm. I have one. You have comment? You can make a comment. Well, my comment is like. Uh, <laughs> we're going to bring it back to the board. We're going to bring it back to the board. Is there any more comments? <laughs> <laughs> You're jumping the line here. As a father of two daughters, most of which you have taught, I have learned a lot over the last few years, and it's about listening and also telling people when you hear them that you hear them. And I want you to know that I hear you, and I'm very confident that talking with my board, and, and when we talk, it, we see you and we, we definitely hear you too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate also the conversation about continuing forward from last year's conversation. So looking forward to that as well. Great. Thanks. And thank you all for being here, even if there wasn't public comment. So <laughs> yes. appreciate, your presence. <laughs> appreciate your presence here too. Yes. We need their support. We need their support. <laughs> We're all united. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, well, you can, if you want to stay or go, it's okay. But just, um, to take action to accept. Oh, oh right. Oh. And okay. <laughs> <laughs> something, some stuff of today. So, um, so uh, it looks like uh, I will entertain a motion on this one here. I'll make a motion that this staff recommends the board acknowledgement receipt and have the Sunshine the RT, RBTA's initial proposal to the district for the 23-24 contract negotiation. Thank you. Do I have a second? Okay. I have the others. Second. I will second. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan. Hi. Chris. Hi. Rachel, hi. Thank Are you. Are you ready? Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. We have pencils for you. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right, so item three on the agenda is the 2023 student assessment data update. So this is Julie and yeah. oh, that is me. Yeah. All right. Um, so starting off, uh, so this, this evening, um, as we do every year, um, is the time that we report on student progress and academics and um, you know, the data, and largely the reports on past data, but we also want to talk about um, the other data that we use um, 
when we're talking about our students. And um, this work is, of course, in alignment with our district LCAP goals. Um, goal one, which has to do with assessing student learning, and goal two, which is really that um, sense of belonging goal um, that actually comes directly from our racial equity mission statement. Um, because we know that developing relationships with students has a positive impact on students' academic success, as well as, of course, their social and emotional well-being. Um, and then I, I brought this to the board before, but um, I have found myself rereading this book um, that is called Street Data. Um, and that talks about different levels of data. And often when we look at schools and districts um, and states and academic success, we kind of stay in the land of satellite data where um, it's kind of that large grain size um, where you can kind of get a sense of trends and things, but it doesn't give you a lot necessarily of actionable data. Um, and so then we move to that map level of data, which has more to do with um, our local assessments, our benchmark assessments. Um, these are also classroom assessments that teachers are giving where they're more diagnostic and they um, inform teachers about where their students are and so that they can make those instructional decisions that they need to make and do make on a daily basis. And then really the data that we um, we don't necessarily always consider as much as perhaps we should is that street data, which um, is, is kind of the, the fine grain size and it's really understanding the full experience of our students and their families. Um, and sometimes that's done through things like surveys and listening sessions, but I would argue that our teachers are, um, it's nice to see teachers here for this presentation, um, are administering street level data on a daily basis when they are walking past a group of students who are working and notice that one child um, is stuck on a math problem and they're taking that in and making sure that they are reaching back out to that child or it's informing what they're going to do next that very that very same lesson within the classroom. Um, and so I've, I've partly already talked about this, but just recognizing that in Ross Valley, we use multiple measures of assessment. Um, we do have district benchmark assessments. Um, and just really remembering that the CASP is but one data point within a larger assessment system. And this slide just reminds us all that the CASP includes our Smarter Balanced Assessments, which are in Mathematics and Language Arts, and then also the California Science Assessment, the CAST, which is given in 5th and 8th and, and then 10th grade. Um, and then the California Alternative Assessment is administered um, for some students who have additional needs um, or need, are in need of additional supports. And then recognizing how the CASP works, um, there are four levels, four performance levels, and in the state of California, what we want is all of our students to either meet the standard or exceed the standard. So when you see the data that you're about to see, the percentages that you're given are all a combination of that standard met and standard exceeded. And then just understanding that um, for English language arts, um, the assessment covers listening, reading, writing, and research. And for mathematics, communicating, reasoning, concepts and procedures, and problem solving. Okay, now we're on to data. Um, all right, so this shows a comparison of the Ross Valley School District, Marin County, and California for English language arts. And we're looking still at these two years, the current year, 2023, um, and then 2019, because 2019 was the year before the pandemic, the last time students took the cast before the pandemic. And so we're still looking to see where we are in terms of returning um, to pre 
pandemic status, right? And we're getting really, really close with English language arts, um, just two points away. Um, and then, you know, which is a little bit better than where Marin County as a full county is doing or the state of California. And then with regards to mathematics, um, we're not quite as close. Um, we're five points behind where we were. Um, and you can see where Marin and California are about the same, five or six points behind. And we are seeing just generally that the catch up for students in mathematics is bigger um, than perhaps it is in reading. Students um, kind of the missed mathematics is I think having a bigger impact on kids. And this is something that's not just something Rust Valley sees, it's something that we see throughout the county, throughout the state, throughout the nation, probably throughout the world, right? Um, for lots of reasons, um, math is, is kind of a different subject. Um, I think a lot of our parents did a lot of teaching of reading and writing when their students were home with them and probably um, in some cases had less access to really feeling that they could support their, their kids in mathematics. Julia, just a question yeah. about, I understand that the, the goal is to get back to pre-pandemic standards, but are we actually happy with those standards? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we're always seeking to do better, yes. Okay, so that's, that's not our, like, we're not going to hit 69% in RBSD and go, yeah, that's, we're going to say it should go higher and higher over time, correct? Yeah, I mean, we are always, you know, wanting to do the very best that we can mm -hmm. and, and recognizing the limitations of this particular type of assessment as well, mm -hmm. but then I would actually say that if we really want to talk about our goals, it's more breaking it down and looking at individual student groups because mm -hmm. we have student groups that are clearly successful and are continuing that success. And then we have some, and there's some slides on this yeah, later on, yeah. but we have student groups that aren't um, experiencing that same level of mm -hmm. success. And mm -hmm. so a lot of our attention is rightly so on those kids. Um, make up that 31% there. Um, wait, I skipped math. No, I didn't. <laughs> Sorry. And then science, amazingly, we're doing um, we're five percentage points above where we were pre-pandemic, pre but I will say that I think, although I'm not sure, that 2019 might have been the first year of the MGSS rollout looking at our teachers to see <laughs> if they're remembering that but I think that was right at the start mm -hmm. and so um, and that's probably why you can see for the state of Marin in California there's not a drop I think we got better at um, teaching that new set of science standards um, which is called the NGSS it's but just, nice to see how well we're doing Julia this is just the fifth and the eighth graders yes thank you fifth and eighth grade fifth and eighth not six of them no, because it's they only test fifth, eighth, and tenth. Okay. And actually, pointing that out, um, I was not able to figure out how to pull only fifth and eighth grade data for Marin and California. So Marin and California, there is inclusive of I don't know if it's tenth or eleventh grade that takes the mm -hmm. the cast, mm -hmm. the science mm -hmm. assessment. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so here this slide talks about data over time. Um, which I think is fairly self-explanatory. And you can see that blue line represents English language arts. And you can see that return post-pandemic. You know, there was quite a drop there right up after the pandemic. And again, in 2020, that's when the pandemic began and we did not administer the CASP that year. Um, but um, but you can see that we are making good progress on our way back and in fact, you know, we do have some previous years, like 2015, we were at 75%, now at 65 or 76%. Um, but mathematics, a little bit less of a comeback there. Um, making progress, we dropped, I think just, yeah, just one point um, from 2022 to 2023. And again, these percentages represent the number of, the percentage of students that met or exceeded the standard. So we want those numbers to be as high as possible. 
And then this slide takes a look at um, some of our similar districts within the county. These are districts that are somewhat similar in size, but um, more importantly, similar, relatively similar with regards to demographics. And then we've also included um, the local charter school. Um, and then you can see where the, we are the green bar. Um, so you can kind of see where we're landing with regards to other, other districts. The, could you go back the top up there? You have the blue boxes of three through eight and three through five. So you've taken the, the last one takes the eighth graders out. So yes, because we have a school listed there that only has um, the the Ross Valley Charter serves Got that through well K through five, K through and five. so that's helpful. It just helps for a more direct comparison. Yep. Yeah, those tables. Okay. All right, this one's a little bit hard to see, but this one um, shows where we are in terms of looking at our similar districts, as well as Marin County and the state, and um, it's by grade level. Was there anything that you could tell in this data or looking at other data in terms of COVID impacts on younger versus older or anything like that? It doesn't look like there's a whole lot, but... Not for English language arts that I can see. I mean, I I feel pretty good about where we are, especially in comparison with other districts um, in English language arts. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, we have had kind of that bounce back as one would, you know, hope that we would. And then here we are with math. And on this one, we, d we definitely have some grade levels that are, um, you know, probably below where we would hope that they would be. And, and we are, of course, on a regular basis engaged in conversation around this and not just looking at this data. Again, looking at, like at the middle school level, we have um, an assessment we give called the MDTP, which is a readiness, a math readiness assessment. And that's assessment, an assessment that teachers use as well. Kind of to get a sense of where kids are um, but I think what we're seeing here is some of that unfinished learning that took place during the pandemic that's been hard for kids to catch up on um, as they progress through the grades So this shows cohort data, um, which means that we're looking at roughly the same group of students. Of course, some of our students come and go each year. Um, but, um, and then the other thing to, to think about and remember that um, as students progress through the grades, the assessment is different and the assessment is based on grade level standards and the standards generally become a little bit more difficult and more complex um, as kids get older in the grades, but um, you can kind of, I, I, I find that last row, our current ninth grade students, really interesting to see where they were in, in third grade and progressing through, like seeing that 80% in fourth grade, which is incredibly strong, and then that big dip there that happened right after COVID, and, the, and then looking at that comeback, I think is um, really, encouraging um, to see and it's similar in other grade levels as well so I really think our um, our English language arts data is strong but it is interesting that that how COVID impacted students transitioning from elementary into middle school you know, I, I, we've heard a lot about the COVID impact of the transition from kindergarten, I mean, from preschool into kindergarten, and then from elementary into grade schools being a difficult, difficult time. to make that transition. Yes. I mean, there's, 
is interesting. You know, I'm sure there's a few studies that come out that talk about which grade levels had the most, you know, impactful. Anyways, impactful impact is a little redundant there. <laughs> um, and then here we are with mathematics cohort. Mm -hmm. And you can see we're having a little bit more of a difficult time getting back up there. We have always seen a dip, and, it's, and we're not alone in that. I mean, the, the county and state always sees a dip in middle school um, math scores. And so we've never really, you know, we've never had that. Well, the, I guess we would have to go to a previous slide to really look at the previous years in mathematics. Um, but we have some work to do here. And um, I have a slide, a slide further on that gives you a sense of the kind of work that we're doing. That also resonates with your very first slide about the connection between that sense of belonging and academics, especially in middle school. Mm -hmm. So becoming so much, so important. Yeah. Which is what they missed during COVID. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, developing a sense of belonging during a pandemic is a really difficult thing to do. Huh. All right, so this slide breaks down our past data, and we began the, the data begins right before the pandemic. That red line shows where the pandemic hit um, by student groups. So that top row shows how we did in terms of all of our students and right and we are talking about third through eighth grade students all students um, the percentage that met or exceeded the standard and then looking at individual student groups over time and you can see that in most cases we really are still making progress in ELA towards um, pre-pandemic -pre levels, and in some cases have exceeded them. What is OCD? Sorry, so, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. And so that it's, so when we look at um, that second to the last row, we're looking at all of our Latinx kids, and then the last row is only those Latinx kids who um, are not socioeconomically disadvantaged students. And then I should probably talk through as well, our English learners, are any of our students who are currently receiving English language development support, and those are those students who also take the LPAC. Reclassified students are students who were receiving support. They were a part of our English learner program, um, but they um, showed themselves to be fluent in terms of their English language and were able to exit the program which is always a cause for celebration. Um, and then your ever ELs is a combination of those two. So anyone who is currently an EL or who is ever in an EL program. And then similar, um, well, this, is, this is what it looks like in terms of mathematics and what we see for some of our student groups is more of a disparity um, than there is within English language arts um, as compared to all students for mathematics. Some of those numbers are really low. Um, and then interesting in particular, those reclassified students that before the pandemic were at 60% met and exceeded and are now at 36. Um, you know, it's really disheartening to see. And we know that the pandemic had a bigger impact on some of our students than it did on others for all kinds of reasons, you know, family circumstances. And... All right, and then just reminding us of our map data. So these are all these other kinds of assessments that we're using within our classrooms to learn about how kids are doing. And, and these are more diagnostic-like assessments. They give. Um, teaches a lot more information than the CASP does. Again, the CASP just gives us a sense of trends, but um, doesn't necessarily provide much information that's actionable. 
So we have a lot of different assessments in English language arts, and it's actually something we're really diving into this year, taking a look um, at whether we might want to expand M class, which is a reading <coughs> screener, um, to other grade levels. We're currently administering it in first and second grade. Um, and we also have some other assessments that we're looking at. There's one called iReady, which is a diagnostic um, we may be taking a look at as well. Yeah. What do we do? Do we do any uh, kindergarten readiness when the kindergartens come in ASQs or KSEP or anything like that for a kindergarten type of deal? Or I, I don't think we do any formal assessments like those. I know there's a lot of kind of street data that's being collected yeah. by our kindergarten teachers immediately. Mm -hmm. And then they use a system, an assessment management system called ESGI that has the BPST, which is the phonics progression inside it. And um, that kind of thing. Got it. But, okay. That's, yeah. Okay. <coughs> you know, we participated in the pilot, of the, um, the KSP, that one that you mentioned, through MCOE a number of years ago. Yeah, yeah there have been right. a couple of, there have been a couple of pilot efforts mm -hmm. to do an initial, uh, in it, trying to make it yeah. align with the individual, the student level or street level data so that it can be similar to this this level kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, and both helpful mm -hmm. in both ways. But. We've been having some really interesting conversations um, with our TK teachers meeting together and talking about the different kinds of assessments that just talk about developmental readiness yeah. um, that they're taking a look at right now. Yeah. All right. And then just a reminder, our street data here, are some of our many fabulous teachers in Ross Valley um, checking in with kids and learning about where those kids are. Um, and just that reminder of how important the work of teachers um, moment to moment is and how much that they are learning about their kids all the time. Good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this slide talks a little bit about our multi-tiered system of support, particularly in the realm of academic support. And it's, um, you know, looking at these different tiers of intervention. Tier one, those universal interventions being um, the kinds of things that teachers do inside their classrooms on a daily basis to make sure that they're meeting the needs of their kids and meeting kids where they are. Um, and then our tier two interventions, which some of which take place in the classroom and some of which take place out of the classroom. We do have intervention teachers and English language development teachers that work with groups of students. And tier three takes us more into that special education realm. But um, we put a lot of work into making sure that we have a really thoughtful system that's well articulated and is common across all of our district schools. Um, and then recognizing and remembering our why of really wanting to have a place in our district where students feel a sense of belonging. And recognizing too that academic success is a part of a sense of belonging when kids feel good about their progress and their learning. Um, then they feel more that they're a part of a classroom. Um, and then, of course, there are all the other ways in which we want to make sure that we're, we're welcoming our students and making sure that they feel respected and celebrated um, for their differences and empowered to thrive. Um, Remind me, are IEPs and 504 as part of Tier 3, or is that another separate? IEPs would be Tier 3, tier three. yeah. Okay. And 504s, I don't know that I would call that a 504s, three. generally speaking, general uh, education accommodations and supports that you would see primarily in Tier 1. Yeah. There could be some Tier 2. Okay, thank you. I have to say, I really appreciate this visual. This one is like the best explanation of an MTSS that I've seen since I've been on this board, and I love this one. Like, it's just very clear, like, where things are. Like, I have this idea that I know there's multiple levels, but I don't know exactly who's doing what where, so this is great. Thank you. Oh, good. I'm glad that it's useful. And again, this is for academic support, and there's the same thing really exists for our um, SEL support as well, and student wellness. 
All right, so what are we doing? Um, so again, we are continuing to refine and implement our multi-tiered system of support. Um, we're continuing to support tier one interventions in the classroom. Our MTSS partners, our coaches, are also supporting teachers with that work. We have a new set of decodable texts that um, our K2 teachers are using this year. And that's a first for us and a kind of a shift in reading instruction to make sure that we have those particular types of texts avail available for students. And a decodable text is, uh, is where the, um, the words within these little books are directly decodable. So words like cat, where students have the skill to say the cat. Put those sounds together, cat. Um, we have been training our teachers on foundations. We trained all of our new teachers and many of our um, experienced teachers who've already been using foundations but wanted kind of a, a review of the program. And I think at this point we've trained either 19 or 20 teachers. Um, so talking a little bit more about foundations. Um, our teachers have been engaged in professional development on structured literacy and science of reading. We are piloting our universal reading screener and looking at diagnostic assessments um, for reading. And then in the realm of math, we have a group of 13 teachers that's going to, going to head to Asilomar in Pacific Grove. There's a fantastic math conference there um, that we haven't been to in a while, but um, I'm really excited about it. I know when I was a math teacher, um, I would say that that was by far the most impactful staff development I ever participated in, and it absolutely changed the way that I taught. Um, and so I get to go. I'm super excited. Um, so we are working on math strategy groups. Our, our elementary teachers are doing strategy group this work this year, both in reading and mathematics. And the middle school is specifically focusing on math differentiation and trying out um, some new strategies, which actually seems to have been going really well. Um, we have a designated English language development class at Whitehill this year. With, I think seven students that is being taught by one of our English teachers, Amber Wild. Um, and actually, I should have put up here, she's using our new curriculum called EL Achieve, but also all of our elementary sites are also using the same curriculum, EL Achieve. Um, and that is new for us. We haven't actually had an EL curriculum that everyone has been using. Um, and so we're hoping to see an impact from that work as well. Uh, we just started at White Hill an after school academic support. Two of our teachers, again, Amber Wild and Virginia Foxton, are offering each of them one day a week. So I think Tuesdays and Thursdays, kids can stay after school and get support. Um, and White Hill is doing lots of work on priority standards where they're identifying a standard, um, doing some planning together in, in their learning team teaching to the standard, assessing the standard, and then looking at the data and determining next steps. Um, and I'm sure there are many other things that I haven't added to the slide that probably just can't fit on there. But um, I do also look forward to digging in a little bit more in terms of math support, the supports that kids need. I've been investigating programs that um, support math fluency, particularly at the elementary level, that I think um, would be really helpful for our kids as well. And that's it. Any questions or thoughts? I thought I, I am a visual learner, so the slides really help me because these concepts that I have to read alone without the visuals are very are difficult for me personally. Uh, I I wonder how my thought is is we will look back on COVID and we will look back on these statistics 10 years from now. I mean, we're seeing two two years out, maybe one year out really of almost gaining. It'll be really interesting to see how these all compare and so we can really get the, the bookends on a life-changing event, you know, in our in our schools for our children. Mm -hmm. And it, but you, but this year you're starting to see a little bit of the recovery yeah. and as it's, it's trending and, um, 
also one of the graphs up there that showed the 5% drop, 5%, 6%, 5% drop across the board when it um, happened. Those, but just to see that we're still doing well in our little bubble of the world and our in the things that we contain, it makes me feel really good about the, the work that we're doing. Uh, but it'd be really interesting to see this five years from now to see kind of really where, you know, how these new things we're doing are bringing us forward and really how high we can get to a point that we surpass the pre-COVID numbers. So um, great job. Thank you. Thank you. Just appreciate the continued disaggregation of the data by the different student groups Mm -hmm. and noticing the, as you had mentioned earlier, the gaps and the differences between those different student groups and then the priority on working with the students who need that additional data. Um, quick question. Do the CASP scores, does the data give you enough um, down to the particular questions to help with any of their priority standard setting? No. You have Not to go with the map level. It the, used yeah. to be that those, those categories that it showed right at the beginning of like the four different areas of ELA, mm-hmm. you used to be able to see how students did in each of those categories, but they have shortened the test a little bit. And ever since, I don't know if that's the reason I'm assuming that's the reason, but it seems that mm-hmm. ever since they shortened the test, we don't get anything other than a total score. Mm-hmm. So again, that's why it's really that, you know, like we can look at the trends, how are we doing? but it doesn't really help our teachers in right. terms of teaching. Right. Okay. That's all. Awesome. I remember once when this came up, I had, was talking with a teacher, and she'd had my child as, as her student, and she said they, they don't see, the, the teachers don't get to see what scores their students ever get. Is that true, or is that, no, uh, they don't see the scores. So they don't really have. Oh, no, 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 they do, they do see the scores. They do. For individuals, or just for their class? For overall? every student. For, well, all of that information is in the areas, but we also created spreadsheets for each site where it lists um, the lists how students did, and it has the, um, the current teacher and the former teacher's name, so they can check it out. This was a few years ago, so I didn't know, but it might have changed. So they can kind of get an yeah. idea of where kids were. Okay. Yeah. So do they get that information, like, rolling up when there's a new school year, like, hey, these kids got these, or they don't get it until later? Uh, that data's, I don't know, I feel like it's been, like, six weeks or something, but I, I don't know of any folks. I think it takes time to there's there's like because this. there's also, we get uh, preliminary okay. information, then we get final, and then mm-hmm. Julia and Paula take all of it. Mm-hmm. You know better than I do what you do, but it does take a little bit of time to compile it and get it together. Okay. So by the time school starts, they don't have it yet. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, you can not say that number, the number crunching was all great because I, I, it takes a lot to get the cohort. I mean, to, to take all the data in the raw format and then renoodle it around for the cohort stuff and the disaggregating and all that is... Not something that is just given to you on CASP, so I appreciate all that extra work that goes into that. Yeah. But the CASP site does, they they give you the mechanism by which you can you disaggregate can. all the data. You know, yeah. And that's very purposeful, and, and that's what the state is looking at yeah. when um, the state has you write your LCAP or California dashboard is about to be released. They're really interested in progress by student group, Mm -hmm. much more so than they are in overall progress. Yeah. Um, Do we have any public comment on this one? Do you want to come up and talk? I wanted to make a public comment. I hope it's okay. Do you want to come up so we can hear you better? (laughs) You just have a seat. Can you state your name? Oh, sorry. Sure, sorry. Hi, I'm Beyonce Vidal. I'm a teacher at Whiteville. Um, And you mentioned the academic after-school support. And that's Amber Wild, who's one of our ELA teachers, and Brianna Hatfield, who's one of our... I said the wrong person. That's okay. I just wanted to clarify because... I'm really proud of my colleagues, and so um, Brianna Hatfield is actually one of our math and science teachers, and so we have a cool balance there working together with that, Um, and I especially wanted to shout her out because she is one of our um, web teacher leaders, um, along with my other colleague, Mr. Alvin Shane over there, Um, and they are also uh, working with that kind of how you mentioned the SEL and that sense of belonging on um, on our campus as well. And so it all ties together and it's really nice. And I'm really proud of my colleagues for all the work that they do to support our students. So I just wanted to 
So we will have yeah, a comment. All right. And we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is accept Proposition 51 School Facility Program and Performance Audit for the White Hill Middle School Project. So this is me. Um, <laughs> obviously, it's an audit. So this is what's called a performance audit. And so... You all don't want to stick around? <laughs> that is so it's an audit. It's an audit. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> so the district had received some state funding uh, when we built White Hill Middle School. And we actually have, I believe it's three additional projects that I'll also be doing this with. And for each of those projects that were all part of the entire modernization when they built like the 500 building, I'm sorry, the 400 building, the 200 building. Um, and they, they did like the, um, the kiln room and did some modernization as well to the existing facilities. We received the state dollars. And as part of that, we then agreed to have a performance audit. And the performance audit simply just looks at all of the expenses, all of the forms, and determines whether we spent the dollars appropriately and did we do what we said. And so this project happened more than 10 years ago that we started. So it was a lot of fun trying to find the, all of the paperwork, but it was something that we were able to find. Uh, and so this performance audit was, was conducted by Chavin and Associates. And really the most important thing that's on here is if you look at this, it's the third page of the attachment, which is just independent auditors report on performance. And if you look down near the bottom, it says, um, you know, they, they go through and they talk about everything that they're looking at, but it specifically says, um, it, if you could go to the third page of the actual, so page three at the top, Teresa. Right there, go down to the bottom of that. It goes through and tells you everything that they're looking at, but it, what is most important are those last two things. Um, the results of our tests indicate that the district complied with the compliance requirements referred to above for the period of June 8th. Uh, 2012 through June 30th, 2015, which is the period of the construction. So in essence, they're agreeing that we, we did what we were supposed to. It was only supposed to be during those three years? Uh, that just happened to be during the period of the construction. And so no, nothing increased through that the scope after correct. that day? Okay. Correct. Yeah. So that that's when the period that they were looking at. And that this is really just intended. It's, a, it's for us and also for the state. This report also gets sent to the state by them. And so that, that's that's what we are looking at this evening and just accepting the report. You know, it's long-winded, but in essence, they've, they've gone through that entire project. And so uh, as we move forward through the other audits, we'll, we'll end up bringing those to you as well. So it's essentially a budget versus actual for a construction project. In the, not, not financially, just a, here's what you said you were gonna build and yes, you built it. Correct. And they're looking, it working in accordance to what you planned, right? right. Correct. They, we had to provide them copies of all of our inspector of record reports. They got copies of um, geotechnical reports. They were looking at everything. Right. And they got copies of our audit. Um, I'm sorry, not our audit, our um, uh, invoices. Mm -hmm along with all of the backups that we're looking at everything. It was a really detailed audit. Um, Is there usually a 10 year lag in an earthquake zone on <laughs> the building? What do you it's, find? It's, it's interesting, like, why, like yeah. you think in, so much can change in a yeah. moment's time in this state. And to wait that long to audit a building that was constructed, it's... Yeah, this is not uncommon. This is not uncommon. It's amazing. Yeah. A lot of the, the projects that the state is dealing with don't even get to this point. They, you know, 
for many years, a lot of the projects uh, were left you know, were left open and not fully closed out. Mm. And they changed the rules uh, back in probably around 2010, 20, mm-hmm. 2012, around the time that this happened, that they now require us to do these performance audits. They used to just accept our financial audits as part of that. We would provide the information and that, that was it. But now, in addition to us completing all of our reports for the state, showing what all of our expenses are, saying that this is how much our arc- um, we spent on architect fees, this is how much we spent on geotechnical, etc. They now actually look at the detail to ensure that we're not charging something to the state funds that has no business as part of that project. Do they ever look at the internal controls? Uh, the internal controls get looked at in terms of um, the financial audit, but mm-hmm. but with this, they were actually asking about that. Yeah. So was- part of the documents we had to provide were like board, um, uh, what our policies were uh-huh. related to bidding the project. We had to yeah. provide documentation on the project um, being bid out. Yeah. It really was a, a detailed yeah. audit that they're looking at. So. Yeah, they they were looking at all of that. Well, well kudos for be, having to have to pull all of that information up yeah. uh, for that time frame in such a cohesive and organized manner. That is a they, this is hard stuff. And actually, we we have to be thankful to our bond um, program managers who we had at the time because they really put it together in a fashion that we could find it that's great because it is it's you know 12 years after the fact yeah. going through the files yeah so that's good Do they, is this a one-time one and done audit or do they this one yes okay. one and done for this project in this, this particular project and this is just a discussion and information that we yeah. accepted. It is a vote. If you look at your agenda online, ah, all right. that fee was just, left off. I was just saying, let me on your okay. It's just to yeah. accept the audit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. do we have any public comment on it this? Was, audit? It was agendized yeah. properly in terms of if you look at your agenda yeah. online, Rebecca recommended approval of. Yeah. And so it was in the uh, subject line, I believe, up above a little bit, Teresa. Yeah, except probably. Yeah. So the subject, um, it has the D and the I in parentheses, not the B, but mm-hmm. you can see the type was is action discussion. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we have no public comments. Do we have any further discussion here? We're done. All right. I will entertain a motion. And please say the project number at the end because I didn't see that when I was announcing this agenda. <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve and accept the Proposition 51 School Facility Program Performance Audit for the White Oak School Middle School Project 57. Um, Dash seven five zero zero two dash zero zero dash double seven. I will second. Okay, a motion and a second, right? Aye. Right. Chris. Aye. Shelley. Aye. Rachel. Aye. All right. Motion passes. Thank you, Chris. All right. So uh, the next thing on our agenda is the recommended approval of developer fee study to be performed by Schoolworks Inc. This is Chris again. This is me again. I think I have the next couple as well. Uh, So this is a developer fee study. The district receives developer fees for for, uh, projects that, uh, in terms of a residence, if you are adding on to your house and and building more than 500 square feet, you would pay a developer fee to the district. If you're building a new home, you would be paying developer fees, or if you're adding on or building um, a business, you would also pay fees to us. Now, those fees are used to um, help build additional facilities for children that, in theory, are generated by the additional building. And so that's the purpose of this. And there is a minimum amount that we can charge per, per, um, per square foot. And the state sets that, but in order to adjust those fees up to the minimum, you would have to do uh, a fairly regular developer fee study. Our last one uh, was done several years ago, so this will allow us to get back up to that um, minimum amount. And the reason we've gone with this particular uh, entity, uh, this is not who we have used in the past, except that 
Uh, this particular vendor just did the developer fee study for the TAM district, and so they've already pulled a fair amount of the information. So it makes it an easier project for them. This is a kind of, you know, when you, know, when you think about what's going down, coming down with the building and that the state, the HCD is mandating that we start to, you know, put into our local, you know, areas, um, you know, and talk of development in San Somo of a 94 unit building at the end, you know, quick math, if you have 100,000, you know, square feet of buildings, that's almost half a million dollars at this Low. So it's good that we're I think that we're at least we're dialing this in and making this now, just because the future of most towns is being pushed by the state are actually talking about you know the development coming to increase population. So having this in place is um, prudent, especially to be you know it's one of the it's one of the arguments that you could say that that does give back um, if things are being built out. How often does is it every single time you want to raise it, you need to do a study or? Um, no, you, you wouldn't need to do it every year, but you probably should do it every four to five years just to, to be to justify it. To right? justify, to justify. Yeah. Because you can use your previous justification studies for a period, but oh. then it just becomes, you you probably should take a look at your numbers. Just so if you get challenged on it, you can say, yeah. We're, yeah we're, so you can use your previous justification calculations and rationale to continue yeah. to shift, but only so far until you have to like, okay, that makes sense. It's good, it's timely. Yeah. yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, do we have any public comment on this item? All right, nope. Well, I appreciate you finding uh, somebody who's actually recently done a study on our area, because so I'm sure that's gonna be very helpful. Um, I'll entertain a motion on this. I'll make a motion to to um, approve the developer fee study to be performed by Schoolworks, Inc. I will second. All right, a motion and a second. Shelley? Yes, aye. Chris? Aye. 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 Rachel? Aye. aye. All right. It is approved. Thank you, Chris. Our next item is authorization to solicit request for qualifications, or RFQs, for vendors to complete a long-range facility master plan. Chris? So this is one of the items that as we were looking back through um, doing other projects within the district over the last year, we came to a realization that the last long range facility master plan that we had was actually done uh, 10 years ago. And you can see the one, the, the last one we did was January, 2013. And so to be prudent uh, and look at our facilities holistically, you really want to have this done about every 10 years. And what this project will do um, would be to involve um, lots of lots of school communities. So we'd be looking and talking to each of our individual schools, each of our um, staffs, et cetera, and, and also the parents and, and the school community and looking at what are what are the needs of the district. And then taking that information and looking at any available funding sources that we might have. Um, just as we were talking about two items ago, that Proposition 51 school facility program in that audit, there are state dollars that are available for districts um, through modernization and other funding sources. And so it's just a matter of getting yourself into the eligibility queue and how long ago did you access your last round? It, because for modernization, you can only do it every so many uh, years. And so part of this whole process would be to look at those funding streams to see if there's any dollars available to the district as, as well to do those projects that might be out there in ticket. And so this is just one of those things that it would be looking at our existing, uh, like what our existing facilities are, looking at the existing conditions and also looking and talking to district staff and finding out, okay, what is it that you want to do with your facilities? How is it that you need to use your classrooms? What, it, what do you see the future of education? So they're looking at educational standards and those types of things as well. And so that's, that's what this would do. This would... Um, authorization of this would allow us to go out for a request for qualifications and put it out to, to get vendors to then apply to come in and, and um, then provide a, 
presentation to its to probably um, like Des Kissock, our director of facilities, and maybe uh, some other administration um, to take a look at um, who would fit the district best, and then bring that back to the governing board for final approval. So this would be just to go out for the qualification. Qualification versus a proposal because you're, you have to prove they're qualified. It's Correct. not just proposing like, hey, I'm going to do this for my ten thousand dollars. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah, because you want to know that they can actually do it. Have they done it before? Um, give us the districts. Um, lots of different pieces of information, and we want them to be able to actually look at our facilities as well. So they have to have some technical knowledge as well. So they're going to be on site looking at your buildings. Correct. Okay. How long of an engagement, contract engagement, do you think it might be? Usually this type of project is anywhere between nine months and 12 months. Okay. So it's not something that happens quickly. And you want it to go a little bit of time because if you're going to do the proper engagement with the different various um, content, uh, people that are you know, your, your mm -hmm. school community, your staff, etc., the only way to really do that type of outreach is to do it over time. When did you start this? Excuse me. Um, well, we would put this out and hopefully get our information uh, back to be able to make a final determination in February. February, okay. And then based upon that, we could start it uh, in the spring mm -hmm. or we could start it in, in the fall. Mm -hmm. okay. It really depends on what we see as best and working with whoever ultimately gets selected because it might be best to actually start it in the fall and finish it in the spring. Mm -hmm. But or they may say, no, let's start it in the spring and then finish it up in the fall. Yeah, yeah I mean, they depends. may want to time, you know, get a bunch of input, have the summer to do something with it and then finish it up. It depends on what their proposal would be for the process. Yeah. I think the long range facilities master plan is the most important thing that we can do for. I mean, I know we're here for kids and we're here for teachers and, and administration and, and the, the workings of the business, but these physical structures are, are in my opinion, the most, uh, it's that ounce of prevention aspect. And we all took tours and we all went and go, you know, saw things. Um, and I was talking to Des and I was talking to Chris. I'm really happy that Chris, in my opinion, has a real his arms around what he wants to do. And I think that the fact that we just don't have a lot of turnover recently in this regard, we, if we can keep that thing going at, in such a way when we talked about, you know, class one, real important things or whatever, how are you tiered them, the second tier things and third tier things, every year you just flip through what you did, like your list of accomplishments, but not like academic accomplishments, but the, physically what we did for the buildings and also being able to streamline uh, what you're doing in each facility so that they're the same materials being you, you know, we, this is really important stuff. And I think if we can continue to stay ahead of the long range facilities master plan, it's going to save us a lot of money in the long run. So it's really important work. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think we're here, not just for today, but we sit in these seats for the future as well. And buildings are long term perspective. You all taking that? Any public, any public comment? If I could just add one additional thing, kind of related to what you said, our buildings are our most valuable assets in the community as well. They are community assets, and so it really is important for us to to really do this yep. and take a larger look at it. We, we just steward them while we are here in this moment, but they will be here. The other before thing, we were and they will be here after the but as, you know, on that point um, to not do this work is not only very expensive but you know if you can have this work done if we get the qualifications ready the ability to grab the grant to grab grant money that's very to fill true. in yeah. is also just it's a it's a double yeah. it's a, it's a, you get fed twice on it not only do we identify what we want to do but we if we have this work done ahead of time and we're ready for it when the, you know, if he's on it we yeah. can grab funds to do some of the projects that we don't have to actually pay for ourselves. Great. Nice work, Bruce. All right, so um, any more discussion? 
Okay. I'll entertain a motion on this item then. I'll make a motion to approve the authorization to solicit request for qualifications to the vendors to complete the long range facility master plan. Second. Oh, second. All right. Okay. All right. Chris. Chris. Aye. Chris. Aye. Rachel. Aye. Rachel. Aye. All right. So we have authorized this one. Chris. All right. All right. On to consent action sure. items. We are able to um, do consent on all of these items in one motion unless anybody has any questions or discussion about any particular one. Okay. All right. And no public comments. <laughs> all right. So I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion unless anyone has any other questions. No, I don't have any questions. Oh, I'd make a motion to make <coughs> consent. Second. Second. Okay. Aye. Aye. Chris, Rachel, aye. Aye. Excuse me. Board business. All right, so we have committee updates and reports from and announcements from trustees. So, anybody want to kick us off here? Um, I, I've been working with the round table on the round table agreement. Back in the saddle on that. Process. <laughs> uh, I believe I've got a meeting coming up tomorrow, the 16th. Tomorrow, yes, at with 4 a subcommittee of the subcommittee um, to continue to work on that roundtable agreement with the goal of getting this getting it settled. And thank um, you so much for um, leaving that. Jumping back in, yes, really <laughs> jumping back that. into that work. So it's good. It's it's definitely you know it's. Creating agreements among, you know, all of the parent groups and the Yes Foundation on how money is raised and how money is spent, and um, I'm really appreciative of the group for doing it through an equity lens and continuing to reflect on that. And it's a really good process of that equity, the time and investment and the equity mission statement and the equity principles. Um, being put into practice and being um, like it's a challenging conversation of saying, okay, so then we have this conversation around a very specific practical question around how much, you know, and, and then people are like, oh, we don't want to. It's like, yes, but then how does that decision that you're just about to make reflect, is, does that reflect those principles or not? And then, and then you know, a wrap conversation. So it's been a really great exercise of exercising that work um, and people have been hanging in there and, and doing it so. well <clears throat> since our last meeting we had a parent equity task force um, uh, meeting at White Hill um, it has been uh, a constant group that has shown up and has stayed committed to this. I think that the energy in the room has really elevated itself to um, a working group status. So we reviewed where we were, uh, reviewed the, um, Reap, sorry, uh, went through um, a lot of discussions around that, had some data that Julia shared with us about um, some of, actually similar to what you, she showed here to us tonight about the, the learning gaps and increases, but in overall, the, the takeaway was positive. We had um, uh, some good discussions around the breakouts. Uh, that uh, the schools are doing, um, and some standouts I think were uh, which, which made us at Brookside go like, oh my god, we gotta we gotta get working here. This is great. Um, Manor uh, is doing a festival, for example, um, and it is um, the, the community at, at not, at not Manor. I'm sorry, Way Thomas, Way Thomas uh, was doing a festival. It was well received by the community. Um, the schools are starting to move away from 
the challenges that their kids are facing to how can we celebrate the differences and create that sense of belonging through activities. So Brookside talked about uh, the mural project that it's planning to do, where they're going to bring in an artist and have a mural put up, um, which I was very happy to I'm part of the tours that I was part of at the schools. I took pictures of all of the murals to inspire some of the ideas that we could probably put in at Brookside as well. So all of these engagements at the schools were brought to light. I think it was inspiring for all of the groups. There were a couple of things that we're going to revisit the next meeting, which I'll highlight uh, the next time we come together. But I thought it was a pretty, um, pretty great meeting, working-wise. Do you have anything to add, Marcy, from that? I, I think no, that I agree. Was it was really good. I think um, just from the table, I sat at a table that had Hidden Valley and Manor, and um, the interest that the parent groups expressed or the different school groups expressed about learning from each other and that sharing. Because each of our schools does have a little bit of a different um, flavor, mm -hmm. their own culture and their own environment. Um, but there are some best practices, and that's one of the um, elements that is really critical about the Parent Guardian Equity Task Force. It's also how the roundtable um, is moving as well, mm -hmm. is to learn and share from each other. And um, because there are really great things going on at each of our schools and they can be replicated. They may not look exactly the same at each of the schools, but the um, commonality for that, all of our students will be going to White Hill. So to have common experiences um, at the schools yeah. was great. So it's, we've come a long way. Long way. Yeah. In our Parent Guardian Equity Task Force work together, um, but it has really grown, I think as Chris just named it, is a working group. Mm -hmm. It's really good. Yeah, good think tank, good think tank, so to speak. Um, and um, there's a lot of a lot of fear in the room to push to push the boundaries. So what hasn't been done before is okay. Let's do it. So it's it's good. Might be might be interesting at some point during the year. I'm going to project the success of the roundtable to have the have maybe the two groups have a conversation together. Mm because the round table is really all around the dollars and cents to be mm -hmm. able to fund mm -hmm. a lot of the work that's happening and the experiences that are happening at the schools mm -hmm. that are being in the part of the conversation with the equity task force and to have to see the alignment between those conversations might be an interesting conversation <coughs> sounds like it could be and it might be good to get those two groups together it might be <laughs> since equity seems to be a threat yes. in the conversation Absolutely. and part of that I'll just say that came out um of that meeting was ensuring that we have a common communication platform. So we have Parent Square, as we all know, and one of the reasons we chose Parent Square was so that any parent, guardian, staff member, their language, preferred language that they would like to read in, they can turn the, um, the content into that language. And so um, part of what we talked about at that meeting, but it was actually um, a Brookside parent, uh, a room parent uh -huh. who had reached out to Sean to say, as a room parent, I would like access to be able to send messages to my child's class through Parent Square, recognizing that there are parents in the class that can't access a regular email communication. Mm -hmm. And so um, that started us with, uh, Sean was working on the pilot with that parent because in order to mass roll it out, what are the questions the parents might have? What trainings might they need? Those kinds of things. So um, that has gone through the process and we um, brought it back to our administrative team meeting this week to talk about um, now it's gonna get rolled out for all. So um, Sean developed a survey that he and I reviewed and it will go to all the teachers so that he can know who are the room parents and then can generate the class list and create groups and parents go. So rolling that out and also um, ensuring that, you know, we already do, majority of our schools do their newsletters through Parent Square, but making sure that all of our school newsletters are in Parent Square um, so that the language can um, 
be whatever. So right now, a school may only have Spanish speaking as a um, as another language, but tomorrow they could have a student register who is, speaks Portuguese. Their family's Portuguese, so needing to make sure that the system is fluid and rolling with it. So, um, so that's one of the elements too, and just in that area of um, equity. So for all of our families to be able to access and be part of their child's school is to know what's going on. Even if they're not physically able to volunteer at the campus or to show up for events, but to know what's going on and okay. to ensure our platforms um, and the way that we communicate gives them access. Yeah. And I think we'll rely on the street data to provide us with who needs that too. Mm-hmm. The teachers will be important to Yes, the absolutely. Because yeah. yeah. they do, they, um, majority of our schools, the elementary school teachers, do newsletters as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and if the platform they currently don't use um, doesn't have the ability to have a different language, then the families aren't accessing what um, their children are doing as a week, on a weekly basis is mm-hmm. how they typically do their newsletters or sometimes maybe monthly, but they need access yeah. and to know what's going on because they care. Um, I also attended their <laughs> racial equity task force meeting. Um, it's uh, it's interesting because I stepped off that a year ago and stepped back on this year. So it's I've seen interesting snapshots in time, like from the very beginning, or not the very, but near the beginning towards now, and like just the the, pro- the progress that's been made in that group, and just how there's still uncomfortable conversations, but it's like it, it's not that uncomfortable. It's it's done with respect, and there's not any animosity, and it was just it's very lovely to see that change and how much. How much growth there's been in that group working together. Um, I'm not going to believe it that anymore. Um, I went on site visits to all the five schools, which is enlightening. It's good to get boots on the ground and take a look at all of our sites and see what's going on and you know where there might be needs in different locations. And um, you know, I don't. I'm not always in different schools. But that's just the one that my child's at. So it was good just to see what the state of all of our schools is, just from my perspective as a trustee. And it's also lovely to see all our teachers and the kids on campus. So that was nice. Um, I went to the White Hill um, Middle School Masquerade concert, which is the chorus and orchestra when they all come in costume and perform Halloween themed music, which is so fun to watch. Um, a lot of the teachers were there too, who were you know not just the music teachers. So it's, it was a really great performance, and those kids did a great job. Um, and then my um, middle schooler was at the White Hill dance that they had, which seemed to be a hit. I didn't hear of any drama. <laughs> I'm like, I've heard of other schools with maybe some drama. So um, kudos to the organizers. They threw a great party. I couldn't believe how hot the gym was when I walked by the door. <laughs> um, but thank you all the teachers and all the chaperones because my kid came home, to, had a great time, was very safe. So thank you to them. And then as far as, uh, yes, there's no meeting this month. There, everyone kind of was like, we're too busy. <laughs> um, so as far as updates, it's a little bit light. They're doing their um, fundraising participation month for November. So they're trying to like get everybody to participate, all the families, just like at any level that they can or that they're comfortable with. And um, they, they've had uh, a lot of progress um, since last year. At this time, I think they're up. It, when I checked last, they were up 12 points from last year for participation, which they were really pleased about. Um, and I think it equates to like almost 100,000 more than this point last year. They still have a long way to go, but it's very encouraging news. And so, you know, they're happy about that. Um, Maybe the end of year bonuses will help. Yeah. <laughs> Pick that up. I'm hopeful. Yeah. And then... Um, they did a call night a couple of weeks ago or last week. I'm not sure where they, you know, call up people who haven't donated yet or new families to the district and kind of just give them a little bit of information about yes. And um, so that's always a helpful, nice way to connect with people. Uh, Victoria George and her band are performing another fundraiser for Yes at Perry's on December 9th. Um, and then Stillwater is doing a joint thing for a dine and donate there, so the same night. So you could go to dinner and you could go listen to the music, and they're both contributing to Yes um, for the fundraiser. So I think that's it as far as my updates go. Ryan, did you have any updates? I had the uh, the same update as you in regard to going to all the, the tours. Um, and I, when we all term out or maybe I just think it's the most useful thing I've done since I've been on the board for me 
Um, I did it four years ago. I took notes. And then when I went back out this year, I compared all the notes that I had. And it was a lot had been done. Um, and I, I touched on it earlier today, but I'm really excited about how Chris uh, and Des are really on the same sheet of music for a longer term project. And so things don't get overlooked. So every bucket gets kicked over. So there's no water sitting in that bucket for a long enough time that we have a capital expenditure like that manor school dry rock we found a couple of years back. Um, and, but also for me, again, as a visual learner, I, I actually really get to see where the, the money goes and where the tiles he's talking about. And the side, um, so from that perspective, for me, I loved it. I'd love to go see what what upgrades we're doing. And, and you're actually kind of shocked. I and mean, I'm sure you saw things, you're like, oh my gosh, really? Like, we do have to do something about this. So it puts an urgency to the level where we make decisions and don't really see the work. Um, but I, there's an unintended consequence or, or that's good actually for this work is teachers get to see us board members caring enough to go for site tours. I had a number of teachers come up to me off campuses saying, hey, I saw you at the campus. That's re- I thought that was really cool that you guys were out there today. It gives them a sense of, uh, of belonging that we that we really care enough to go do this. Uh, more than just, oh, I'm new, I've never been here, that kind of tour, like really walking through with Chris and Des and seeing what the things are and seeing what the problems are. It also helps us relate to the teachers, but also it helps us relate to the parents. Like, oh my gosh, that field really is bad. Like, yeah, and I know what you're talking about. I was over there. So I think it kind of brings the community together. I think it gives us a more intimate level of what the problems are from the facility's perspective. And I think it has the uh, the other consequence, uh, not the consequence, it's not the word I'm looking for, but it has the um, ability to, to show that we also care beyond just sitting up here in these kind of meetings that it, it takes a big, it really counts to that we factor that we talk about in these meetings, that we care enough to go there and see the problems in real time. So I think it has that, 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 um, that bonus. You know, for, I, I toured as well, and, I, and the biggest takeaway I had was how much work Chris yeah. <laughs> yeah. has Johnny yeah. do to, to keep our schools in the state that they are. It was, I was so full of gratitude for you guys, and, and, and just having the ability to just walk around and you you knew every corner of the school you knew where the bird was that was here and, <laughs> and I was just I felt as a trustee I felt I took a deep breath out knowing how much all of you have your hands and eyes on our schools yeah. and it, it was great and I really think it was so valuable and I appreciate it I really appreciate the work you guys are doing so much you know you like what do you ever sleep yes <laughs> you know i mean it was just amazing thank yeah. you thank you yeah that's why you can't just leave now institutional knowledge matters and also to add to that the one thing that you said is the ability to document this stuff so we're going into next year it's like a living document you know all work changes we're always on a moving target with budgets trying to forecast he's doing the same thing with the facilities but the next person can pick that up and say okay these were the red targets for this year and we didn't get to all of them so they should still be up there but we got all these and so and they can keep looking at the other things to not let them get in a state of disrepair so that's a big savings nice job yeah all of that work yeah yeah Fantastic. Right. Any more updates or are we move on? Did I was I missed the um, last uh, legislative did it did it? Let's go. Yeah. I missed it too. Okay. Make it recorded. The next one. I don't think so. Okay. Okay. There's no public here, so we're going to move on to approval of regular meeting minutes for October 11th, 2023. So, did anybody have any edits, comments, changes? Would they like to approve this or make a motion to approve this? I think, hold on a second. Ryan, you weren't there for this meeting? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's the super short one, right? Yeah. Yeah, no. I didn't have anything. 
Yeah. I know I'm terrible about that. No, it's great. great. <laughs> it's it's heavy. I'm like, ah, it's so little. No. All right. Well, I'll, I can make a motion, right? I can. Yeah. How about I move that we approve the regular meeting minutes for October 11th, 2023? Okay. I'll second that. All right. Uh, I, Chris? Aye. Shelly? Aye. All right. I'm Ryan. Where's Dave? All right. So those are approved. Thank you. Um, next item three is recommended approval that the Board of Trustees holds its annual organizational meeting at its regular meeting on December 13th, 2023. All right. So in accordance with education code, um, we need to hold the annual organizational meeting. And this is a year in which we don't uh, we didn't have a board election. So it needs to be held on a day within a 15 day period to commence with the second Friday in December following a regular election. And if you don't have an election, then it is to be that same time frame. So we have one meeting in December. It's December 13th. And so staff recommends that that is the um, date at which you will hold your annual organization meeting. That seems very reasonable. (laughs) You're here. All right, well, we have no public comment, so any discussion and questions? No? All right, I'll entertain a motion then. I'll make a motion that we approve that the Board of Trustees hold its annual organizational meeting at its regularly at its regular meeting on December 13th. I will second that. All right, Shelly? Aye. Chris? Aye. 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 Rachel? Aye. All right, so that is approved. And we move on to H, Superintendent and Cabinet Report. All right, thank you. And we'll start tonight with um, Eric Sable, Director of Student Services. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I was waiting for it. <laughs> I was waiting for it. Must, uh, good luck, Charm. Let's see the lollipop. So, so um, a couple quick updates. Yesterday, uh, out at White Hill, um, they hosted um, the Student Wellness Ambassador Program. There are four school districts. Cross Valley, Lagunitas, um, Belina Stinson, and Larkspur um, that are working with the County Office of Education to build this um, uh, student uh, leadership cohort um, called the Student Wellness Ambassador Program. They said that. Anyway, so there was about 20 uh, middle schoolers there yesterday with some uh, staff members um, and also Kristen Law from um, MCOE. And they had all day training um, on communication skills, learning how to you know go out there and be uh, leaders and peer uh, facilitators. Um, it was really special to see, and um, I want to thank Michelle Pelton, our school counselor from White Hill, uh, especially for um, I believe we had like seven uh, students from White Hill that were that were a part of it. Um, and you know this is just kind of the, the launch um, for for this year, and uh, I'll be excited to you know report out on, on more uh, activities from this youth leadership cohort in the future. Very special. I wasn't able to stay for the whole day, but I was there um, to to see it get going. So that was really cool. Um, and it was also hilarious to hang out with some of the hall kids and none of them knew who I was, which was super funny. So I was like, I know who some of you are. Um, and then um, last week, uh, uh, all of the site administrators and Julia and myself and our psychologists um, participated in a um, training um, with our district's uh, a legal counsel um, for special ed. Um, uh, on a training for uh, Section 504 uh, implementation. Um, and so uh, that was really uh, productive, um, and it's uh, also um, something that requires uh, just our knowledge across the board in terms of being consistent, um, uh, you know, in our, in our continuum, and even as we're working to transition over to the high school. So. I'm um, super productive, um, and uh, yeah, so that was a, another great learning opportunity for our district team. Thanks. Thank you. And Chris Carson, um, Chief Business Official. Two things.
things. Um, one, thank you for what you guys were saying earlier. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, it's We're really lucky to have the staff that we do in the maintenance and operations department as a whole. Um, everything that happens, happens because of the dedication of this, those staff. So um, thank you. Uh, and then the other thing is, Oftentimes people don't realize that the direct link between the county office of education and school districts in, in each county. And with the Marin County Office of Education, we have uh, a financial system at the county level that every district uses. And the county is looking at potentially um, going to a new financial system. It's not just the financials, it's also the human resources system as well. Mm -hmm. So it touches many different areas, uh, accounts payable, payroll, um, HR. And uh, the last two days we've gone through and they put out an RFP and we're looking, they had narrowed it down to two different vendors. And uh, the last two days we've been looking at those uh, different vendors as a, as a whole county. And so we have uh, had our staff also attend those meetings. So it's really interesting to see what that will ultimately, uh, what comes out of that, which system we ultimately choose and when that implementation comes, because that does have an impact upon everything we do. Um, you know, it, you can look in, in newspapers and see county offices of education and districts that have changed to different financial systems over the last five, 10 years and the negative impacts. And so our county, our county office of education is taking a really um, proactive and, and um, stance where they, they're involving the entire um, county in the process and all of the various departments. So I, I'm very comfortable and confident that it will be a positive process as we move forward and we'll let you know more as, as we go. So I just wanted to make sure that the, the governing board is aware of that, though. It's great to hear, because one of the committees, the E2 in efficiency and effectiveness and kind of um, back-end sharing, service sharing, and to hear kind of the on-the-ground outcome of that approach from our county office is great. Thank you. And Julia Wilka? Um, just that we are having a series of meetings with our TK teachers and a um, consultant whose name is Betsy Fox. And Betsy is a, she's been doing early childhood education for a very, very, very long time. She's um, been a principal. She's run a number of programs and she's now consulting all over the country. Um, but she also once was a parent in our district and she's just terrific. Um, and it's really helping us to define what it means to really have a transitional kindergarten program. And as our students get younger and younger inside these classes, and in a couple of years, students who start in August, will some of them will be three years old. As long as they wow. turn four by September 1st, they're good to go. But th th just saying that number three, even though it might only be for a couple of weeks, gives you an idea of how young these kids are. And so really, this very important equity initiative from the state um, is this development of another grade level. And in the past, TK has kind of been like kindergarten with a little less academic, you know. It's been a two-year kindergarten program. Yeah, it's, it's really been a two, yeah, that's a good point. Snacks and and really, TK is preschool. Like if you really think about uh -huh. it, beginning of four years old, uh -huh. TK is preschool. And so um, Betsy is helping us to kind of make sure that we're moving from kindergarten adjacent programs to a preschool program. And she's now working with a group with our, our TK teachers and a couple of our principals and myself on writing our mission and vision. And it's just been really exciting. It'll be something that we'll be bringing here probably early in the new year. We should have it done. We want to have it all ready for um, our TK um, and kindergarten preview nights and so that we can really give parents a full sense of the very play-based program, you know, that, that we are developing. 
Um, but it's terrific work. And then we've also, um, she's agreed to work with us and provide for the Institute for TK Teachers. So on January 8th, which is our next professional development day, TK is actually going to have their own separate professional development day really focused on TK needs. So it's kind of it's exciting and fun and different. Mm-hmm. And if you ever like just need to get cheered up, just walk in a TK classroom. <laughs> You'll immediately get a hug. You know, you want to play blocks? They'll say yes. That's pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> and just a quick reminder, TK is no longer will no longer be optional for parents. Oh no, it is it's, it's not it's, it's remain not. optional. It's not TK and K. Yeah. It'll it'll continue to be exactly. optional. Yeah. It will continue to be optional. Yeah. Okay. It's just that districts do not have an option to not, to not, not offer it. it. Yeah. yeah, I just yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, well, I have a couple of things. Um, looking forward to, um, you talked to, you know, tonight and uh, kind of reported out on your uh, facilities walks, your site walks. So I'll be reaching out to you all to do some teaching and learning walks. And so getting inside the classrooms, um, so in the new year. So as many of you as who would like to do that, and Julia um, and anybody else, we would like to have um, do those walks with us. But um, would be awesome and amazing because it idea. is really yeah. important for Great. Um, the teachers to see you, mm-hmm. to see the students, and to then know from the outside in what goes on at schools. So um, I'll be reaching out to you all to get um, those dates, and hopefully it'll line up just as easily as it did for the um, the sidewalks. So be on the lookout for that. And then um, Target River, we're on schedule um, to be having the rollout. So our schools just reviewed the descriptions of their schools and made some revisions and changes um, that will be used as part of the, um, the campaign. And then um, they are just ran by me their campaign on the various social media platforms. So um, um, Meta and uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram. And so looking at those, so those will be rolling out soon. Our new student registration for the 24, 25. So we're just, you know, barely third of the way through this year and we're already planning for next school year. Next year's registration process will be completely online. So I want to give a huge shout out to Teresa, who has been reworking the back end and connecting with our school nurse to look at our health appraisal form and how to get that rolled into an online, um, the online aspect of registration and to have that not be a separate form that parents have to fill out and so um, but in order to support all of our families because we know that some don't have access to technology because it's a completely online program um, and we've historically it's been two components online and in person so you, some families may have felt perfectly comfortable with just filling out an online form and then knowing that they could show up at their school with all their documents and the school would take um, copies of them and so on well now families can directly up Upload all of the documents that are needed, like verification of their child's age. But again, some families um, needing access to technology in order to give them the same opportunity that any other family would have to be able to start that registration process and or to complete it. The registration will go live at 5 p.m. It's historically gone live like at 12 a.m. It'll go live at 5 p.m. And then that same night on January 16th, we are hosting a technology support night at Manor School from 5 to 7. So families can go. Um, Sean also um, working behind the scenes and Jorge will be hugely instrumental in that too is to make sure we have all the technology there. Um, Spanish translation and to support any families whose language um, they, they need support with that. And um, and then we'll also have food and child care so that every a family can come. And then starting the next day, they can show up at the school just like um, they would do for any in-person registration. They can get support at the school site directly too for that if they're not able to make it on that night. And then we'll see how well attended it is. We'll see what the um, feedback is from it. And we may host another um, night event as well. Um, and so we're looking forward to um, to that and that along that fits along with our equity work as well. Awesome. Does the, I forget, does the Tiger River 
Target River. Target River, sorry. In, in what was their feeling on like banners or like flyers up at businesses and things like that? That's like, we're time to register and that kind of stuff. Or, or did it include anything like that? Or yeah. could the messaging that they've been developing be adapted? Yeah, we can absolutely do some of that. And so like some of the, Teresa was just working today on our TKK um, preview night flyer or registration flyer that would go out through all the preschools that they could forward out to the families. Is there some of the language that we're looking at that Target Rivers come up with to enhance our website as well as to put in the messaging and vice versa. There was a component of the flyer that we've used that was really awesome. And there was a component that I want to get feedback on to one of the... um, um, social media campaigns that I'm going to use some of that language to give um, back to them for that editing purpose. Right. So, um, so we'll look. We'll be looking at everything, um, knowing that their focus is knowing how is the best way to reach families, mm-hmm. and so we know in in talking with them that. Um, just from feedback when we asked parents, how did you learn about new student registration? Did you see the flyer that was um, we sent to your child's preschool? The preschools aren't necessarily sending anything out. They're not forwarding what we give them to provide to the parents. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so we do need to rely on the aspects that we know this generation of parents utilizes, which is social media. Mm-hmm. And our banner has been really helpful that we have over uh, Sir Francis Drake in Senate Summer and um, uh, Fairfax to help know and to you know keep that message out there um, and so we're also Teresa working on right now getting our um, new student registration page and then the grade level specific pages um, updated and so on so that they're um, that we can go live our goal because we're also getting feedback from our TK and K teachers about a um, student information sheet that we've historically um given parents to complete, but in realizing that the information that they complete is sometimes if we, since registration starts in January, it's almost eight months old by the time the child starts school. That's a really, there's a lot of growth that a four-year-old is going to have, or, you know, um, pretty soon they'll be three years old, a few years before they're starting school or a five-year-old that they make before they start school. So we're looking at doing that differently. Um, and going more likely to maybe a Google form that then can be um, provided to the parents once they've registered. And it'll be, it can be rolled out closer to school starting. And then the other one is our preschool information. So that's been really helpful for the teachers is to see what the preschool teachers um, have to say about the child's development <coughs> in preschool. And but looking at that is if it's through the registration process, it means that there's another layer of complexity by having it completely online through ARIES, our student information system. So we're getting feedback from the teachers about how to um, how to do that. So that's all due back in December. So we're looking at our our um, our website going live as quickly as we can have it be updated. Um, And then the new student registration, as I mentioned, will go live on the 16th of January. Um, The critical part about the um, the feedback is um, Julia, Eric, and um, some principals, they all, and Sean was a big part of it, they hosted a technology night to help support parents getting access to the platforms that we use, Parent Square, Aries, and so on. And so we, I had a debrief with Sean around what were some lessons that you all learned from that so that we can make sure that we're improving for our next technology night to support new student registration. And one of those is to make sure that there is a, a person who can speak Spanish at each of the stations and that they can direct they need to know how to do the ARIES online registration because it will be too time consuming to have the AA as an example say okay blah 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 and that then the translation or the interpretation happens and then the parent does it so we need them to know exactly to know how to move through the ARIES system and so um, one of the reasons we've done the timing of new student registration we where we have is we want to do a training for everybody participating we don't want to do it during midwinter or sorry winter break 
because the two week break would be way too, they'll forget everything. So we're going to have it the week before. So, um, so, you know, all the backwards planning that goes into and all the details, but we're looking forward to that. That should really help all of our families with new student registration and then moving forward our back to school, all of our forms, we're going to be streamlining that process even more as well. So um, moving forward with that. And then um, just as a reminder, we're all going to the, or most of us going to the AEC, the Annual Educator Conference um, after uh, fall break. Um, we, let's see, and then um, Julia and I, so one of um, our parents who's new to our school district, um, she's a Native American, and um, we have started talking with her, and she's connected us with um, the Coast Miwok tribe in order to help us develop land acknowledgements. And so she's made that initial connection um, with um, um, one of the uh, members of the tribal council to, and his feedback was you develop it and then you run it by us. So at that point when we're ready, um, this parent will um, be helping us with that. Nice. And so it's just as we're um, celebrating and honoring Native American Heritage Month, um, we're also moving forward because we know when we started out doing land acknowledgements, um, we learned a lot through that process that it isn't um, just enough to go through and do a land acknowledgement, but we really need to connect with the tribe tribes or tribe tribe or tribes um, who land we're on and work with them to develop it it needs to be meaningful and just like all of the equity work that we are doing we have a why behind it and so that's the next step also with the land acknowledgement it's not just working with the tribe or tribes whose land we're on but also to make sure that we get feedback and input from them and then to continue. So what we're also learning through this is that there needs to be more than just a land acknowledgement. But what is our purpose? What is our reason for this work that we're doing? And so looking forward to this parent, she um, has worked for the Native American Museum um, in Marin County, has done a lot of teaching. She actually was a student when I was at White Hill, and uh, we made that connection in, in one of the meetings that we had, and now she has um, her son at White Hill. And so looking forward to continue. She's a wealth of resources, has shared numerous resources with us. Um, as you know, Julia develops um, the kind of the background and the um, that is the frame for that's given out to all of our teachers in our schools for our various um, months and um, to have somebody who also then can review that and she has and provided Julia with more information is really helpful to keep building out um, the celebrations and the honoring that we do. So i um, really glad to have that partnership and to be moving forward in that. So stay tuned. We may, we'll be talking with our administrative team um, after fall break. Um, each site may develop their own. We will certainly have a district one. We may end up deciding to have one for the district and that's utilized on um, that sites and the district. So we'll just be working through this process and seeing where we go, but um, it is very exciting yeah. to make um, that a land acknowledgement meaningful and to do the meaningful work that we are and um, when we are celebrating and honoring people is to also be able to know why we're doing that and to make it purposeful in the work that we do. So looking forward to that and um, we have Soups Council. We had postponed a meeting because um, some of the sites didn't have their site uh, council reps yet and we needed other reps so we are working on that. So that'll replace the roundtable meeting that we canceled in order to get the subcommittee time. Um, so it'll be December 1st. And then um, last is I just want to um, just share how grateful I am to all of you and all of our staff, teachers, faculty, and staff in our district as we enter into this season of um, holiday celebrations and um, just a time to share and acknowledge um, just the gratefulness and for our students and our families. This is an amazing school district and just to think of the growth that we continue to make in all aspects and we're not perfect. We may never be perfect, but the growth and the continued movement forward is what's critical and important and to show for our children that 
we're not static. We continue to grow. We continue to evolve. And we are here for them. If it weren't for our, I want to say three-year-olds, because we do have our <laughs> early childhood speech program already in our district, um, all throughout our eighth grades, 14, maybe in some cases 15-year-olds, um, that this we're here for them. And we're doing everything we do for them. So thank you all for doing everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we don't need item I, which is continuation of closed session since we completed that. J is meeting review, and so uh, future board topics and board direction. No input, anyone? None for me. Then moving on, there's still no public here, so no comments. Uh, meeting debrief. Thumbs up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Appreciate it. No problem. Good. Good call. All Thank right. You. So we don't need a motion to continue the meeting, and I will adjourn our meeting at nine seventeen. Thank you all for.